Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we direct your attention to the words of Deuteronomy chapter 5. They're on page 6 in your worship folder. They will serve as the basis for our meditation this morning. The Lord says through his prophet Moses, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. This is the word of our Lord. Dear fellow believers, joining the rest of our Savior Jesus. What comes to mind when you think of Memorial Day? Rest and relaxation, time spent with your family and friends, and maybe even a barbecue? Remembering. Remembrance as our nation recalls the ultimate sacrifice given by so many in wars going back to America's earliest days. How about rejoicing that summer is finally getting its unofficial kickoff, its activities are starting, and maybe especially for the kids, that summer vacation is coming really soon. Maybe you're simply rejoicing because you live in a free country. Now back in 1868, there was no Memorial Day. It was only a couple of years after the nation-rending violence of the American Civil War. The grief and the wounds were still quite raw. And people were honoring their war dead. Their loved ones. Nearly every family had a loved one or a friend or someone that they knew who had lost their life in the Civil War. And so people would honor their war dead locally or personally. But there was a desire to make this a to do that nationally, and that was growing. And finally, in, in 18, <coughs> before May 30th, 1868, a man by the name of General John Logan, who was the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, was actually a veterans organization of Union Civil War soldiers, uh, he, he, made a, he issued an order basically stating that on May 30th, 1868, which wasn't the anniversary of any battle in the Civil War, that would be Decoration Day. That would then be the day for people across, especially the northern states, to decorate the graves of those Union soldiers who gave their lives during the Civil War. Now, in 1873, New York State was the first state to make that an actual official holiday. By 1890, all the nation, all the northern states were participating, and later on, the southern states joined in when Memorial Day was Decoration Day was expanded to those who gave their lives in all wars. It started with remembering. 1971, Memorial Day became a national holiday, which then became a three-day weekend. It became an opportunity to rest, too. Today, Memorial Day is a day to rest, to remember, and to rejoice. Back in the Old Testament, there was no Memorial Day either. For a certain way, after Sabbath day was like Memorial Day. Shortly after rescuing the Israelites, God's people, from 400 years of slavery in the kingdom of Egypt, the Lord gave his holy law to his people. He issued it through the prophet Moses, their leader. The Lord gave ceremonial laws that gave specific details about sacrifices and festival days. The Lord gave civil laws that guided the daily life of people so that justice and peace would rule in the land. But above all, the Lord gave his moral law as his holy guide over the lives of his people, over their thoughts, and their words, and their actions. The Lord gave that to his people, and we know that moral law has the Ten Commandments. Within that moral law, and especially within the ceremonial law, God had commanded his people to celebrate the Sabbath, to set aside the seventh day of the week for worship. 
It's been 40 years of wandering in the wilderness due to their forefathers' rejection of the true God. The Lord had finally brought his people to this place, and soon they would cross that river, and with the Lord's help, they would take that land that had long been promised to their ancestors. Before they did so, however, the Lord wanted to remind them once more about his law. He wanted his prophet Moses to teach them that law, to remind them one last time. You see, Moses was not going to lead his people into the promised land. Moses would die very soon after this on that side of the river before they would cross into the Canaan. So they needed, because they were going to go without Moses, they needed to remember what God had told them. Now as Moses recounted God's Ten Commandments, he spoke about God's command to set aside the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and call your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, either you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. God wanted his people to rest on the Sabbath, which the word Sabbath actually means rest. He wanted them to spend one day a week not working, but spending time with him in his words. Now people back then were a lot like people today. Every day was a day to work, to open up shop, to go out to the fields and put your animals and your hired hands to work. But what about time spent with the Lord? If the Lord didn't tell them to do so, they would never take that time. They weren't going to stop. But God wanted them to stop working as, as, he, had, as he had done on the seventh day after six days of busily creating the universe. So God told them to rest pause from their work on that seventh day. What? What was the purpose? The Lord wanted his people to take time on the Sabbath day so they could remember. They were to rest to remember. The Lord told them, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Like Memorial Day today, the Lord wanted his people to remember. He wanted his people to remember what they were before. They had been slaves, lowly, poor slaves, slaves to the ancient Egyptian Empire. But he also wanted them to remember who their God is. He wanted them to remember that their God is the creator of the universe. He is the Lord of heaven and earth, and above all, he is their Savior God. They were to remember what the Lord had, their God had done for them. Remember those ten terrible plagues that the Lord poured out on Egypt so they would let his people go? Remember the miraculous deliverance over and over again that he did for his people, parting the waters of the Red Sea, or the gracious way that he provided for his people by providing food for two million people over 40 years, every single day, with manna, bread from heaven, and quail. They were to remember these things, and now the Lord had them at the very banks of the promised land, and he was going to let them into that promised land. And no army, no ruler, no force of nature was going to stop them, because they had the Lord their God on their side. At the same time, the Lord wanted his people to remember what he had promised. Remember that he had promised that a Savior was going to come. One who was going to give them more than just a Saturday rest. One who was going to give them rest for their souls. A Savior who was going to give them eternal rest. And so each week, the Lord wanted them to pause, to rest, and to remember. Now, resting and remembering each week on the Sabbath would lead God's people to rejoice in their Savior God and who they were in Him. Each week they would be refreshed to joyfully serve him and to serve each other. And so this went on for centuries. Eventually, that Savior whom God had promised, he came. He came teaching and proclaiming the good news of true rest for every soul. Rest that would last for eternity. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Yet there was a problem. After centuries of keeping God's Sabbath law, many had come to see that law on that day as a burden, as something that they had to do for God. It wasn't a source of rest and refreshment for their souls as they spent time in God's Word. At most, they remembered how God delivered them in the past, and many 
Tom would simply throw off the oppression of the hated Romans and give them what they wanted, an earthly empire. But that's not why Jesus came. That's not why God established the Sabbath to begin with. God had established the Sabbath so his people could rest and remember and rejoice as they looked ahead to the coming of eternal rest through Christ. And that is exactly what Jesus came to do. Jesus brought rest for hearts that were burdened with the guilt of a lifetime of sin. Jesus brought rest for hearts crushed with grief and worry and fear and rejection and loneliness and the pain of death. Jesus brought rest for souls. And because Jesus brought rest for souls, all that God's people have been remembering, all the miracles and the deliverances and the rescues and, and, and all the blessings God had given and all those victories that God had given to his people, all of that, including the actual Sabbath day itself, were all shadows of the reality to come. Jesus coming with rest for souls was the reality. Now, some still trying to make the Sabbath day a burdensome law for God's people. And to that, the Apostle Paul responded in his letter to the Colossian Christians that we heard earlier. He said, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Because Christ fulfilled that promise and brought the reality of his rest to our souls, we are now free from the command to worship on the seventh day. In fact, the Christian church started worshiping on the first day of the week, Sunday, shortly after Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. Sundays became a mini Easter celebration for God's people for centuries. However, we are, even though we are free from worshiping on a specific day of the week, we are not free from his gift of time to rest and remember and rejoice. God wants you and me to spend time with him. Well, why? He wants you and me to spend, he wants you and I to spend time with him so that like those ancient believers, you and I can have regular rest for our souls. In this world in which we live, there is no end to the busyness or the distractions that pull you in every which way, every direction, away from the Lord and His Word. Given the opportunity, you and I could spend every single day of our lives, from sunrise to sunset, from waking up to going to bed, busy with this, that, or the other thing, and never have a moment with our God. We can devote all our time to selfish gain, or we can devote all our time to the distractions of the here and now, but the Lord wants you and me to pause, to stop, to rest, to be refreshed in Him. He wants you to rest in His everlasting arms. He wants you to drink deeply from the cool, clear waters of Holy Scripture so that you may be refreshed. He wants you to hear and read and meditate on His Word regularly. He wants you to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to prepare and equip you for another week of faithful service to Him and to each other. And so He calls you to rest in your Savior. He calls you then to leave with that Savior all that burden that's weighing on you week in and week out, and to leave it with Him because He'll carry it for you. Our God has a purpose in doing this. He wants you to rest so you can remember not like the Old Testament Israelites, we have an advantage. We get to look back and see how the story all played out, how God fulfilled all his promises, how the Savior came. We can see everything that took place. God wants you to remember who and what you are by nature. A sinful human being, a slave of sin and death and the devil. Yet God also wants you to remember what he has done for you. He wants you to remember his logic-defying, unconditional love that we heard about in Bible study today. He wants you to remember what he did for you through Christ. He wants you to remember the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus willingly gave for you, giving up his own life for you on the cross. Much like those who honored the war dead from years long gone, like my great-great-grandfather who, in 18... 
1975 started placing flags on the graves of his Civil War comrade, God wants you and I to remember. Each time we gather for worship, we have that opportunity to rest, to remember. Each time we gather together, we look back and we remember what we are by nature. We're sinful, hostile enemies of God. We're condemned to hell. But yet we also look back and see what our God has done. We see how He loved you so much that He willingly gave up His one and only Son that you could be His child. He did that to make you His child. We look back and we remember how Jesus willingly fought the fight to set us free. How Jesus willingly won the war for our souls by His own death on the cross. But unlike all those who honor their Lord dead, when we stop and pause at Jesus' tomb, we notice that it's empty. There's not a body decaying or turned to dust in that grave, but instead, Jesus won His greatest victory on Easter. When He abandoned His tomb, left the tomb wide open and empty, because death could not hold Him. We see that, and we remember that Jesus did what He promised. How do you respond when you rest and remember what Christ has done for you? You rejoice. You praise our God, not only with words, but with lives of service, with lives as, with your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. You can leave our time of rest and remembrance here at church, and you can leave and, and head out, out those doors refreshed and ready to serve your God, your God who loves you more than you possibly can imagine, your God who gave up everything for you. And you can serve Him with joy. Serve one another with joy. Because you have been rejoicing in the fact that you have been rescued by your Savior God. This weekend, be sure to rest. And enjoy your time with family and friends away from work. Remember those who gave their lives to enable us to freely worship here and, brought pe and, and enjoy peace in this land. Rejoice that summer begins. Rejoice that you live in a free country. But above all of that, more importantly than all of that, and especially even when the weekend comes and goes, rest in your Savior God. Remember what your Savior God has done and rejoice.